I want to introduce the first speaker of this session on passion, safety, and quality improvement. That is Dr. Harvey Lander. Harvey Lander is currently director between the flag, sepsis and medication safety at the Clinical Excellence Commission in Sydney, Australia. Is night now. In this role, he is responsible for supporting clinicians and health services to improve the quality and safety patient care across approximately 200 hospitals and health facilities. He works a lot. He has a long experience in medical services, in clinical governance, and especially in patient safety. Please, Dr. Lander. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to share some of the work from Australia and the Sepsis Skills yeah. Program. The Clinical Excellence Commission is, works in the New South Wales health system and its vision is to provide the safest and highest quality care for every patient. Through leadership in quality and safety, through increasing the reliability of healthcare systems and also through building a culture of built on improvement and supporting clinicians and hospitals. And I wish to recognise all the clinicians and the hospitals that have contributed to improving the management of sepsis. New South Wales is approximately 7.5 million people. The College of Excellence Commission receives uh, data from hospitals and, and serious adverse events. And the genesis of this work came from 2008 and 2009 when New South Wales noticed it was no different to the rest of the world. There was increasing incidence of sepsis, which was associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Through the serious adverse events, what we call SAC1s and deaths, there was a recognition that there was a failure to respond and also detect uh, sepsis appropriately. And so, in addition to this, we also noticed that there was a failure to manage the ongoing care appropriately in, in our hospitals. And also, importantly, there was a failure to see sepsis as a time critical illness. So what do we do about it? Well, in 2011, we introduced the Sepsis Kills Program. On the back of some other work we'd done in terms of building the reliability of systems through the deteriorating patient a safety net system that we'd developed in 2010, the Sepsis Kills Program was predicated on three th important things. It was to recognise the risk factors, signs and symptoms of sepsis and inform senior clinicians. To resuscitate with rapid, appropriate antibiotics and IV fluids within one hour and to refer to specialist care and initiate retrieval if needed. Because our remit was across so many hospitals, both very large tertiary to the smallest centres in our rural locations, we needed to think carefully about the implementation of the program. Much of our work, uh, initial work, was based on the international guidelines for the management of severe sepsis and septic shock. In terms of sepsis skills timeline, I have here on this demonstrating the initial rollout in 2011, which was in the adult emergency departments, initially with a few pilot hosp hospitals and then uh, up to 50 hospitals. That progressed to 2013 when the paediatric emergency departments implemented across the state. In 14, when we actually rolled it out across the inpatient settings, both in adult and paediatric facilities. And more recently, over the last year or two, we've developed specific guidance for maternal and newborn pathways for managing sepsis. And this year, we've revised our pathways to assist clinicians. As I briefly mentioned earlier, Between the Flags, which was also a statewide initiative, was developed and uh, rolled out in 2010, just before sepsis kills, on the understanding that we wish to improve the early recognition response to clinical deterioration and reduce potentially preventable deaths and serious adverse events in patients who receive their care in New South Wales public hospitals. Because the primary factor for for death and poor outcomes related to deterioration, this was something we had to do and consider right across the system. Both 
programs between the flags and sepsis used an implementation model that was based on a multivalent strategy with governance and leadership being crucial at all levels from the, from the ministry, the central agency, CEC, but importantly from the local hospitals and the cluster of hospitals. We recognised that leadership was crucial at, by frontline clinicians, department heads in hospitals and the like as well. In addition to the overarching governance, which saw uh, establishment of various committees and various processes to support the clinicians, we were de developing and have refined standard clinical tools to assist in ensuring the improved reliability of care. The clinical emergency response system was also something very crucial and we, that was rolled out across all hospitals as well. Education and evaluation were the fourth and fifth elements. Very important that we assist clinicians. The Clinical Excellence Commission undertakes site visits and part of this rollout saw uh, many visits to many hospitals to talk with clinicians and hospital executives about how to optimise the local uh, uh, implementation given the varied facilities we were supporting. In terms of the evaluation, whilst we were measuring the sepsis uh, time to antibiotics within one hour, we were also measuring the rate of rapid responses and cardiac arrests across the system. And over that period of time, the last five years, we've seen a pleasing increase in the rapid response rate and a significant reduction in cardiac, in cardiac arrest rate. Just recently, We've also, our partners, research partners, have published in recitation a, a journal demonstrating that there's been a 20% reduction in low mortality DRGs over the period of time after the implementation of Between the Flags. In terms of the standard clinical tools, the pathways we developed um, with the clinicians leading and providing advice over the last five years aren't seen to be prescriptive because clinical judgment is considered key. However, they include the necessary initial uh, bundle of care for sepsis. And more importantly, uh, and on, in an ongoing fashion, uh, we've developed um, more recently tools that assist the ongoing management of sepsis once the patient is admitted to the hospital for the first 48 hours. The reason we did this is because we noticed that the ongoing management needed to be improved and because of the feedback we got as, as we were trialling and testing in the hospitals over the last few years, that, that we needed to review a number of issues um, and to ensure that the ongoing management was improved and patients' deterioration uh, was detected and treated. The very significant um, actions that we took included the responding to the bundle six actions, keeping it simple. And all these elements of oxygen, lactates, blood cultures, antibiotics, fluids, and monitoring reassessment were actually embedded in the clinical pathways that the clinicians could use. Uh, and that actually helped, uh, has helped with reliability. We developed significant education resources with clinicians at the fore presenting on a matter of things in terms of deterioration, uh, sepsis, videos, and other materials uh, that, that could assist um, clinicians, particularly junior staff, in terms of providing education. And we've made this readily, readily available, and we've had thousands upon thousands of staff who have access, ass, assessed them and provided feedback and, and got benefit from them. In terms of evaluation, whilst initially we were looking at time to antibiotics, I've antibiotics in the first hour, we all, um, as well as a uh, second leader of commensurate of IV fluids, we actually then decided to focus primarily on IV antibiotics, which was um, provided to us in a voluntary sepsis database. And from this database over the years, uh, um, you can see that we've had significant improvements in the time to the first antibiotics. So that 80% of patients are getting their antibiotics within two hours, and significant proportion within the first hour. We published our work in the Medical Journal of Australia at the start of this year, 
looking at the two years before the rollout of sepsis kills and the two years after. And this demonstrated a pr very pleasing reduction in mortality from 19.3 to 14.1%. A reduction in the time in, in intensive care and also a reduction in the mean length of stay. Subsequent to this, we've also looked at the data for 2014 and 2015. And this um, demonstrated that we continue to have a reduction in mortality. No matter how we cut the data, whether we looked at ICD-10 coding uh, principle only or all um, secondary uh, di um, coding diagnoses, it demonstrated that we continue to have a downward trend in the order of about 13% uh, mortality from all, from all sepsis. So what are the, some of the lessons that we've learned over this time? Well, we know that earlier identification and treatment is crucial to, to getting good outcomes with sepsis. We also know that early senior medical review of patients prevents poor outcomes, and we've seen that time and time again with our SAC1 or serious uh, adverse um, outcomes and deaths. We've gained an appreciation that the inpatient setting in our hospitals need to have more focus and this year we focused on integrating with antimicrobial stewardship. And we've taken the feedback to ensure that our pathways and our messaging about sepsis includes the fundamental importance of choosing the correct antibiotic initially, to ensuring that we take appropriate cultures and that we follow up uh, with the antibiotic and, and results of the cultures at an appropriate time. We know that the importance of leadership, clinical leadership in the inpatient setting, given its complexity and various clinicians' input, uh, is also very important. We've also been watching the rapid response team and the system that we've developed over New South Wales and the critical role that that can play, particularly where patients' observations stray and the observation charts uh, require the in frontline clinicians to call for help and the intensive care unit uh, responds to the ward. We've also uh, ad addressed the, some of the unintended consequences of the program, ensuring the appropriate any cultures are taken, the antibiotics are appropriate, and that we continue to follow up the patient once they arrive on the ward because we know that that's a particular risk when they're not in the emergency department and they may not be in the intensive care unit and they may not be monitored as closely. In the end, we know that all improvement is local. The criticality of, of the hospital leadership, both the executive, the directors, the senior clinicians, and the governance and resource availability is crucial. If we focus on improvement and we use methodology, we believe that we can improve the reliability of the bundle of care, that measurement which, which senior, as we know, doctors particularly and other clinicians respond to data and that measurement is undertaken locally and that the hospitals look at their, their cases, reviewing where they can make improvements and the frontline clinicians um, take ownership of that process and teams are focused on improving care. We know if we can do these things that will provide uh, in continuing uh, um, capacity to make improvements in the care of the patients yet to come into our system. I'd just like to acknowledge all the staff in New South Wales who have contributed, the patients who have been part of videos and the carers and who have told their stories. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. There is a question for you. I am a CNS in emergency in a district hospital four years down the track, and we have had a fantastic success in reducing time to first antibiotic using the sepsis skills program. However, I am still meeting with resistance from some, some doctors to using the pathway. Can you offer some suggestion as how to convince these team members of the benefit of the pathway? Yes, that, that's a very good, very good question. And yeah, my advice would be that 
in terms of engaging doctors, clinical, clinical medical engagement is very important. And that uh, we, in our program, we usually have clinician experts and clinician leaders uh, in, in, in the hospitals who are convinced of the importance of a way uh, of approaching sepsis in a reliable fashion using tools and resources. So the most important thing is to have clinical champions and to have the executive support. And doctors respond to, to um, data and to evidence. And then if you can demonstrate in locally that the benefits are to the patient of ensuring that reliability of the initial care for sepsis that we know is evidence-based, um, and producing uh, better outcomes. And so we can use the literature. The Clinical Excellence Commission, I'd also say, is always available and willing to assist and um, to have conversations with, with, with clinicians, particularly in smaller places where there, there isn't necessarily the breadth or the depth or the numbers of, 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 of senior doctors. Uh, so this, this is important. I think I, we would always make that um, offer um, available for us to visit should that be required. But essentially it's important to get an, uh, at least one or two senior doctors who are very supportive uh, of impro making improvements and if you can measure locally what you're doing and you can demonstrate that you're making improvements both to what the care you're providing reliably but also to patient outcomes, then that will speak, uh, help to speak for itself. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, be, before ending this uh, session of this extraordinary World Congress on sepsis, uh, I want to stress uh, to all the audience all over the world to become a supporter. Sign the World Sepsis Declaration everywhere you can, on Facebook, on, on all the, uh, the um, Facebook, uh, Twitter, but sign the World Sepsis Declaration and become a supporter. Thank you to all speakers and to the audience uh, to have followed this session. Thank you.